so now we are online and uh, hello and welcome and uh, comrades from the youtube channel midwestern uh, midwestern marks uh, the link to this channel you can find in the description and uh, we will speak today about uh, complicated question with the marxist theory so firstly could you present your channel your activity who you are and uh, all this stuff um, we were editors at the Midwestern Marx Institute. It's a uh, institute for Marxist theory and political analysis out of the U.S., although we have uh, correspondence from around the world. Um, our main uh, goal in this moment in the U.S. is political education, the development of uh, a, a genuine uh, and unique American uh, Marxism that helps us understand our current situation and, and move forward in a revolutionary manner. And we do that in as broad uh, a form as possible, whether it's through social media activity and, and TikTok, which you know we've been censored through, but uh, we've been able to gain quite a bit of traction on there, um, or through uh, website articles, or through our publishing press with books, or through our uh, you know scholarly journals, or our YouTube segments, which include anything from you know more laid back uh, podcast uh, discussions to interviews with leading Marxist scholars from around the world and and communist militants, so um, a little bit of everything, but uh, the, the central thrust of it is that it's an educational institute out of the U.S. hoping to provide some ideological clarity in these troubling times. Okay, uh, so maybe first question, do you know something about the history of socialism in Poland, uh, the, do you know some Marxists from Poland? Do you know the history of the communist movement, which existed in 19th century, and in uh, and also the history of the Polish People's Republic? Do you want Do you want to take that one, Carlos? I don't I don't know a lot no. about Polish history. I do know uh, we know a bit about Soviet history in general. Um, it really Poland is sort of a hole in my personal knowledge. So that's why I, if you have something on that, Carlos, I'd love to hear it. I um, actually, one of the first uh, uh, Marxists that I uh, read that were somewhat influential for me was Adam, Adam Schaff, um, who was the professor of philosophy at the university of Warsaw, Poland, and a member of the Polish Academy of, of Sciences. Um, and, his book on Marxism and the human individual was um, was uh, very interesting. It dealt with uh, questions that uh, are conceived to be more related to to the earlier Marx, the question of alienation, of uh, the question of you know the role of the individual in, in Marxist theory. And I think it did a really good job in in attaining, I think, the correct position because it's a book that's embedded in a debate between uh, you know the Althusserians and. Now they try to lump in, you know, some of the other Marxist uh, Leninists and, and and Marxist theorists out of the socialist camp with the Althusserians and uh, the the Western Marxist humanists on the other side, where the humanists were saying that, you know, the the early Marx uh, of uh, the one that's focused more so on alienation and embedded in a Hegelian, Feuerbachian jargon, that's the that's the real Marx, um, which you know, conveniently enough, the real Marx is the one that comes uh, uh, in in the manner of manuscripts that are less than 200 pages, not the one that writes, you know, uh, three volumes of capital, theories of surplus value. The, and then uh, but the other side was saying, you know, just the, the alienation uh, discussion, more specifically the Althusserians, they try to lump in the Soviet theorists and that's not correct. The Soviet theorists appreciated, you know, the role of alienation and how it developed in Marx. But um, the other side of the debate with the Althusserians was that you know, the question of alienation was just a, a youthful musing for Marx that it, it doesn't really hold any weight and that there's this epistemic break that takes place right around the time that he's writing uh, what we know now as the German ideology, a book, but uh, it was actually a series of articles that Haim Engels and a few other of the German um, young Hegelians were embarking on to try to create a journal out of. Um, and the, there's this idea that there's this epistemic break, and so the youthful writings don't really matter. It's a Marx before Marxism. And what uh, Adam Schaff does is a position that you know I hold, and that 
uh, uh, you know, some leading uh, Marxist uh, uh, scholars today, like uh, Marcello Musto, he just recently published an anthology on Marx's writings on alienation. Uh, what he proves in his anthology is that the, the theme of alienation and the theme of, you know, human emancipation in that form of discussion, it doesn't leave Marx uh, in 45, 1845, 1846. It sticks around and concretizes and refines itself throughout uh, the whole of Marx's life. And you can see similar humanistic uh, the tinges if you really read, you know, Capital closely, if you read specifically the Grandrisa, where he's using similar terminology as he was when he was when he was younger. So um, that's the, the 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 connection that I have uh, with with Adam Schaff, and I've read some of his other uh, works as well. Um, but yeah, that's as close as I, I I've got into the Polish uh, left. Can can I can I add a little bit in there, please? Of course. Great. Uh, so speaking of the Grandrisa, I think it is, and it wasn't really out when Althusser himself was working, but it does give us a lot of tips into how Marx thought because it's his own shorthands. It's his own sort of way of taking notes as he's setting up things to write. But on the, the sort of young Marx and old Marx subject, what they seem to be doing is separating Marx into two completely separate things. And the dialectical materialist method that Marx creates prevents us from doing this, right? It instructs us in how to read Marx himself and apply it to him and anyone else that you need that foundation. You need that young Marx to change over time as he grows, et cetera, and learns and become the older Marx, which still has the kernel of the young Marx within it, and could it be any other uh, way? Yes, I, I would like to say that I am in the very big impression that you know Adam Schaff. Uh, it's, it's a very big surprise. I think that if I ask uh, most of the Polish people, uh, do uh, do they know who is Adam Schaff? Of course, they will don't know. Uh, so, so, so bravo that, that you know him. I, I would like to add about him that uh, in the time of the building socialism in Poland, he had a very good position, but unfortunately him and many other Polish Marxists in the after when there was a problem in the socialist Poland, uh, he became revisionist or even uh, social democrat. So, so we need to remember that uh, when we talk about the most of the Marxists from the socialist bloc, that uh, they very often change their position. Uh, and uh, if somebody lived long, um, that normally when uh, in the in the <laughs> 1990s on in or the beginning 21st century, uh, they are social democrats or even liberal and anti-communists. So, mm. Uh, so also I would like to add that uh, um, for the people who know nothing about the history of the communist movement in Poland, I would like to say that in the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, communist movement in Poland was very, very strong. Uh, the, the, the better example is the participation of the Polish workers in the revolution 1905. And in this time, every socialist movement in the world uh, looked what's happened in Poland, what's happened in Russia. And they were impressed the the power of the movement, the creation of the Soviets and uh, all these stuff. Unfortunately, uh, now the communist movement in Poland is totally destroyed, uh, and the Polish, uh, uh, the Pol in the 19th century was a synonym of the revolutionary because most of the Polish people who participated in the insurrection after they were um, they were active in the revolutionary movement, for example, and there were many um, Polish who participated in the Commune de Paris. 
in 1871. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of examples, the Polish. Uh, um, it's a little similar for the activity of the Kurdish people, uh, Kurdish people now in the leftist movement in, in Western Europe, that in the, every country, fr France, Germany, England, and uh, you can find the activity of the Kurds and there are a lot of leftist organization they are strong they are uh, disciplined so uh, so but it was before now it's changed now the the Poland is uh, one of the the Polish population is one of the most anti-communist uh, is, is, is more than 30 years of the anti-communist propaganda, anti-communist brainwashing. So I am I made this channel and I made this conversation to change it, to change it. And I hope that you will help me. So, uh, um, so I prepared some question for you. It's a question. Uh, easy, I think, for you, mm, and so I, I will read. Uh, uh, I would like to know what do you, mm, what is your answer? Uh, so first question: In Marx's time, there was a continuous numerical growth of the industrial working class. In 1988. 89, as a result of the capitalist counter-revolution, there was a desindustrialization of Poland and a rapid decline of the working class. Similar phenomena later followed in other Western countries. From this perspective, how do you assess the chances of victory of the proletarian revolution in the countries of the West? It's, that's a great question. You know, there is a, a really large parallel here to our country, the United States, in deindustrialization and what this does to the proletariat. Um, here, you know, we've had anti communist propaganda for since the beginning, really. Um, and, and that's affected things. What really affected things was the rise of our middle class. And this laid the groundwork for deindustrialization. Um, here and what we seem to be seeing now is what we call a higher stage of imperialism. There's a lot of theorists in China, like Cheng and Fu, uh, right now that discuss imperialism as being in a higher stage. But basically, the way imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism, this neoliberal order that the entire West has gone into, and former Soviet countries, uh, countries like Poland. Uh, must get subsumed by, right? That um, causes a shift and that middle class to be re-proletarianized. Now, I'm not sure what, what things in Poland look like, but here, what that means is all of the children of our middle class are falling down to a level very similar to the proletariat uh in a, in a sort of way that there's no ability to accumulate any stability. Uh, debt is forced on them. They're stuck in menial service jobs and there is no way out. And this is sort of the defining essence that creates the proletariat in the first place so that, uh, and then the rest is sort of characteristics that are built by the history around it, right? So what we seem to have here is the proletariat having shrunk, still in a revolutionary position, but in need of an ally, which is, in the U.S. at least, the re-proletariat. And I see it as very similar to the original worker-peasant alliance in the ability of the proletariat to... Uh, rally the material interests of all the working people together. Yeah, I, I think that there's this, there's this important distinction that's made in Marxism and more specifically in Marxism-Leninism uh, between the proletariat, which exists at the point of production uh, and, and whose work functions as productive uh, labor, um, which doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it uh, produces a, a tangible object, 
there's productive labor that doesn't produce tangible objects. And it also uh, doesn't mean that, you know, productive is uh, good labor, unproductive is bad labor. There's no normative tinge. It's just a more technical way that uh, Marx uh, describes some of the differences within the working mass as a whole. And, um, you know, in, in, in capital itself, he's still considering the distinctions between productive and unproductive labor to be distinctions within the proletariat as a whole. One of the things that I think that we must emphasize is a, a statement that Engels makes, um, I believe it's an anti-during, which is that, you know, definitions are the death of science. Because definitions by their very nature, they take phenomena that exist in movement and interconnection and freeze them and, and reify them from that context and take them away from the atmosphere in which they live. And so the, the way that Marx looks at the question of the proletariat is itself dynamic. You know, the most basic uh, abstract level is a class of people that uh, without having means for subsistence are forced to sell their labor power in order to survive. But then that definition itself concretizes in various forms. And you see in capital and agricultural proletariat, you see the industrial proletariat, which is itself the heart of uh, industrial uh, capitalism. Um, and the stages that come after that, it's the proletariat that's most directly uh, exploited and out of whose surplus value uh, and exploitation, really the condition for the possibility of the wages and the salaries of other parts of the working mass uh, arise. Uh, but you also see uh, Marx describe, again, these unproductive uh, segments of the proletariat as proletariat. And he he's constantly using metaphors and capital uh, to you know, servants in ancient slave societies that are uh, basically existing as what today we would call service workers. Um, and although they're unproductive, Marx wants to continue holding the, uh, to the idea that they are uh, exploited and they're part of this revolutionary uh, proletariat class. So I think that although the industrial working class has shrank, I still believe in the idea that uh, we, we developed here uh, out of the Communist Party from figures like Henry Winston which is the idea that that industrial working class are the front rankers in the, the struggle of the proletariat. They're at the front because they're the ones who's out of whose surplus value, again, you know, everything uh, is, is created and everything is premised on the surplus value extracted at, at that point of production. But uh, nonetheless, the proletariat as a whole continues to be a revolutionary class. And with this phenomenon that Noah describes as, as re-proletarianization, um, you know, the effects that we had uh, in in the post World War II era, where we had the growth of a middle class in the U.S., the growth of petty bourgeois consciousness in a big uh, uh, faction of the population that otherwise previously would have been part of the proletariat and could have developed, you know, proletarian class consciousness, with the development of neoliberal capitalism, that's being destroyed, and we have to remember, you know, the the conditions that that lead to this. You have a very serious crisis in the 70s in the Western capitalist world. You have had for the last uh, two, three centuries before that, a continuous fall in the in the rate of profit. And capital is faced with an option. Either I invest in, uh, in, in you know, developing industry, which is not as profitable as it was, it's barely profitable, or I take the speculative route of financialization. And uh, capital here in, in the West, in the US, in Britain, in certain other parts of Europe, to a more limited extent, it went out the route of financialization. And those effects reflect themselves in the in the determinant form the proletariat in the U.S. has taken. And uh, primarily, you know, if you if you pick out of a pool of 100, uh, 90 percent of the uh, time you're going to pick a, a working class person within the service sector in the U.S. as opposed to one within some of the more productive injuries. Well, industries, which would have been the case, you know, maybe uh, seven years ago. So I would like to say two things. Uh, first, uh, the, uh, this question about desindustrialization in Poland, it was a political decision without any economic sense that uh, when the solidarity take power in 1989, uh, they were scared that the big factories, uh, the mines, the, the, the places, the shipyard in, in, the, uh, in the Gdańsk and Szczecin 
which they showed how how they are powerful in the time of the strikes against the socialist Poland. The first things what they do, they destroy destroy these factories to destroy the big concentration of the uh, well-organized working class. And it was very stupid because uh, uh, 15 years later, when Poland became a member of the European Union, uh, the, the, um, the, um, the Polish workers are the cheapest one, maybe not the cheapest because they are Romanian and Bulgars who are, we, we compete, we, we make a competition with, with other other Eastern European workers, but uh, the, the wages in Poland are were seven times smaller than in Western Europe. Now is uh, maybe three or four times smaller, but uh, and uh, Poland uh, pr profited that in the last 15 years, when the Poland is now member of European Union, we have some reindustrialization, re but this working class which was created now is different working class which existed in socialist Poland. In socialist Poland, there were very big factories and all this industry which was in Poland was produced from A to Z in Poland. The, the resources was, was uh, extracted in Poland and the, the, uh, now we have uh, we have situation that we have some things which are important, for example, from, from China. Uh, but in Poland, they are taking together and this is produced in European Union. So we have the factories which we can uh, uh, close in one day and they can move these this, this factories to another country. Uh, so, uh, but uh, this example that the capital al always search the place where is the cheap labor shown that in 1990s, the Polish workers were cheap. But they destroyed the, uh, the 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 proletariat in Poland in 1990s because it was it was very well organized force uh, and so th this is the uh, first wings uh, and second uh, um, now I am I am uh, I don't know if you are I, I I told you or not I am not living in Poland uh, I since nine years I am living in France. Uh, all, also because uh, when I was active politically in, in Poland, uh, I have some problems. So now I, I don't have problems and I am living in France. I participated in Yellow West movement four years ago and now I am... Um, I, I tried to wrote a book, write a book about, about Yellow West movement. And one thing which is very important to me that I, I, I have um, I examine I, I, I examined the history of the class struggle in France and um, and the yellow West movement in my opinion it was it is it was uh, not proletarian movement but either uh, the petit bourgeois movement. There were some proletarian, there, there were unemployment people, but there were also some uh, small, uh, small entrepreneur uh, stuff like this. And when we look at the history of the revolu revolutionary movement in France, we see some very interesting thing that the, all the time when we have big revolution, the bourgeois revolution in 1789, after uh, 1830, after 1848, or even uh, uh, Commune de Paris, all this time was this revolution made not by the proletarian, but by the uh, artisans. I don't know how it is uh, um, traduction, translation in English, but this guy, the petit bourgeois, who are, they, they own, um, they own um, place to workshop to which they are in, in the same time, the um, um, property of the, of the, uh, um, you understand what I'm seeing, what I'm, and when yeah. they when they tr started to make a industrialization of France, and the proletariat became 
the most important force in France, the revolution in France stopped. We don't have any revolutionary success which we can compare to, 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 to this revolution which existed before. When we have this revolutionary, uh, when we have this proletarian movement, uh, pro big proletarian uh, industrial class in France, the, the, the revolution in France stopped. And where, one thing which, uh, which I try to understand, but nobody can um, explain me, that in the time of the Yellow West movement, uh, we have division of the working people in France. I am emigre and I work in, in the place with another emigre. Most of them, they came from Africa and they didn't participate in this movement. So the proletariat didn't participate in revolutionary movement. And in the same time, petit bourgeois make a, activity which i consider that it was revolutionary activity after uh, after we can uh, ask question if this was uh, fighting for the socialism uh, it was anti-capitalist movement or not but it was revolutionary movement they have forced courage to to fight and and uh, i i am interested what do you think about this you know just in broad strokes generally if we look at history, a lot of what creates revolutionary motion isn't so much the proletariat having fully formed and becoming itself, but the process, the beginning of the process of proletarianization. And this is one of the reasons we put so much emphasis on what we called reproletarianization earlier. If you look at in, in Russia, for example, um, it was as capitalism was beginning. And as the old way the peasants were living was no longer possible. And I think we see a lot of this happening right now in the industrialized countries, right? Uh, as imperialism sort of goes into more and more acute crises, the middle classes uh, are disappearing. And it's this that is pushing people into motion. I think you, you also present a, a question uh, from a more historical angle. You mentioned that when the, something along the lines of when the working class, uh, when the industrial working class was at its largest and most organized was when less revolutionary activity took place. Um, or did I misunderstand what you were saying? Uh, Is that maybe, uh, we don't have any historic, any any revolution which we can compare with the revolutionary activity in the, uh, before uh, Commune de Paris, we have some activity that the, we have communist movement which uh, existed in the time of the Second World War and the uh, the welfare state in France were um, introduced in the first government uh, created in 1944, and it was the coalition government with also four ministers from the Communist Party of France. And the, the leader of this party, Maurice Torres, he was responsible to creating something which is called in France, uh, uh, Sécurité Sociale. A Sécurité Sociale, it's uh, pensions, it's the... It's Social the, Security. Uh, Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It is it's very, very good system. And bourgeoisie tried to destroy this uh, uh, even 40, 40 years. And they destroyed, destroyed, but there, uh, there are still uh, uh, a lot of things to, to destroy. Uh, this pension reform, which now Macron introduced uh, one month ago, and and yeah, and yesterday in in France we have very very big mobilization. In Paris there was half million people who demonstrated. In all the France, more than two million people. Uh, and the pensions, it is also security social, and it was introduced by the communists. So, so um, I don't want to say that the uh, that the the um, proletariat, uh, French proletariat, uh, did uh, did nothing because it's not true. But uh, 
I they uh, he don't take uh, political power. Right. I I think that one of the this has been like one of the most important questions in Marxist scholarship ever since the failure of the revolutions in Europe following uh, the Bolshevik revolution. Everyone expected up until like 1922 to 24 that Europe would erupt specifically starting in Germany and then rolling across Europe and it didn't it didn't really happen um, and you know a variety of, uh, of ways of thinking about this issue emerged um, most famously perhaps Gramsci's uh, which you know developed the idea that uh, as opposed to uh, Russia um, which uh, did not have the chance to develop what he called uh, the integrated uh, state, a state that takes within itself civil society and that um, is, is able to, at a whole nother level, um, solidify the hegemony of, of the ruling forces. Russia wasn't able to do that, so it was easier for the Bolsheviks to break through. Um, and, and it was uh, more directly uh, a war of maneuvers and, and less of a war of position. So less of an ideological war and more so of a direct a frontal attack against the existing forces of Tsarism and, and, and capitalism. Um, and the idea was that in Europe, Europe had been able to, thanks to the 1848 revolutions, consolidate uh, a state that was much more complex and that was much more involved in the ideological construction of, of society, such that peoples whose fundamental interests were opposed to the existing order we're identifying with it at a whole nother level, at, at not just the level of ideas, but at the emotional level, at, at uh, the level of passions. So the, the work that, uh, that you know, Gramsci says that in, in light of that, you know, the, the main battle in Europe ends up being a war of positions, a war of ideas, an ideological warfare uh, against uh, this ruling hegemony. And, you know, he doesn't use the term counter hegemony. This is a term that comes after with Gramscian scholars, but he, he pushed the idea that what what needed to be promoted was uh, proletarian hegemony. So we needed to have our own institutions that shared our own ideas, that developed you know our own art and our own ethic and you know eth ethical political transformations at the you know at, at the comprehensive level of changing the human being, and that that was necessary for Europe. Um, there's a there's a similar uh, there, there's an interpretation that while not rejecting that uh, says. Uh, something different about why the proletariat didn't act in a more revolutionary manner. And it comes from uh, this scholar uh, within the tradition of analytic Marxism, which, um, you know, Noah and myself and the, the folks at the Institute are not in that tradition. We adhere to the traditional dialectical uh, materialist uh, worldview as the philosophy of Marxism. But I think this uh, fellow, he's, he's a professor at NYU and one of the ideological leaders of the, uh, of the, um, He's the editor of this journal uh, in, in the U.S., Catalyst, which is one of the main uh, theoretical journals of the democratic socialist movement. His name is Vivek Schiber, and he's, uh, we've interviewed him before, and he's got this uh, theory of the uh, material, this materialist theory for explaining why the, the proletariat doesn't act in the ways that it would seem almost intuitive for it to act, which is, you know, in a revolutionary manner. And his idea is that as opposed to you know, the idea that it's it's fully ideology which keeps the proletariat contained in their positions. He says it's material factors that condition the proletariat to resign themselves to the existing order for the sake of just like not starving, right? So um, the level of precarity that uh, working people are subject to if they decide to be more militant is something very very harsh, right? You know, we have in the U.S. an example of um, right now Starbucks is one of the, the places that's unionizing the most. And uh, one of the frequent tactics that the owners are using is whenever a vote for unionizing is positive, they just shut the whole store down. You know, and what happens at the level of working people's everyday life when that is the case? Well, they lose their job. They lose their ability to pay rent. Uh, if they're students, they lose their ability to pay for their semester fees in their school. If uh, they're in debt, like the vast majority of Americans are, they can't pay debt. So it's it's a very difficult condition that uh, working people are put in if they decide to organize in a revolutionary manner. And so 
what this uh, uh, theorist, uh, Vivek Shiver, what he says is that, you know, it's not that, it's not necessarily ideology that keeps them contained. It's the material conditions. And where ideology comes to play is as uh, the force which says, you know, even though these difficulties can be experienced by you if you do X, Y, or Z, if you act in a revolutionary manner, it is still worth it. So ideology has a more positive role than the role that Gramsci saw, which is one of containment and then a positive role. You know, so it, it's it's not that ideological warfare doesn't play an important role. It does. But we have to realize that uh, as, as working people, the future that we face if we organize in a revolutionary manner is is very dull because the capitalist has the ability to just throw us off work. And, you know, what do we do? We just join the 600,000 uh, homeless people wandering around in the U.S. with with 33 times as many empty homes. So that's a, that's a factor that I know at least in the U.S. plays a very important role in it, and it's it's played an unexamined role. Now, the, the role of the Communist Party should be to take the mo most militant elements of that working class movement and secure a living for them. This is the idea that Lenin had of professional revolutionaries, right? The people who have this the skill and uh, who are charismatic and who are the sort of people that their fellow workers can look up to um, and who are developed uh, theoretically and who have the ability to spread class consciousness across the proletariat. These people are obviously going to be targeted by the bosses, uh, but they have the ability to take that risk because the party would back them up. And because we don't have a strong communist party, uh, because of you know decades of attacks, the, the you know the crumbling of the Soviet Union, a, a variety of factors. But because we don't have a strong communist party, we don't have those material conditions in place that would secure, at the most basic everyday level, the existence of working people who decide to take leading roles in in revolutionary militancy. That ties real quick into the one thing I would add to that is that you need both subjective and objective factors to accomplish revolution, right? This is something, I mean, the dialectic teaches us, but Lenin explicitly goes into it, what objective factors we are necessary and then how we can intervene in that subjectively. And the fact is that we've been behind in the West uh, for decades now, since really even before the fall of the Soviets, we've just been behind. We had Euro-communism, in the U.S., we were just kind of following the Soviets around by the tail. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But the, in order to genuinely advance, we not only need the most advanced revolutionary theory, we also need to take into account what the sort of current social consciousness is and best way to present that to people. These professional revolutionaries, Carlos mentioned them being charismatic, that's a necessity in the 2000s. It just is uh, where people make snap judgments on everything. And I think that's something communists often forget because we get so blown away by the, this sort of objective truth we're uncovering as we learn Marxism. We tend to forget that just being correct isn't enough. You need to be correct and also be able to show people that be able to show that you have the way forward, the way out of the crisis, because a, an impossible crisis is coming. We know this through the general laws of development. And if we aren't there to follow through on that and play that subjective role, we end up with fascism. Carlos likes to quote uh, Walter Benjamin, who is sort of the only redeemable figure from the Frankfurt School, right? Um, who says that every... Uh, every fascist rising is a failed socialist revolution. I would like to say that uh, um, I didn't want it to present this discussion uh, in the in the way that uh, it's, it's very popular, especially in the students uh, student circles talking now. The working class it is no longer revolutionary. It was not my goal. Um, I um, I only wanted to say that uh, now I see some paradox uh, that uh, uh, the working class are very, very passive 
and uh, in the same time the other class the small bourgeois class or a small entrepreneur or uh, i don't know how to name it they in my point of, in the last years uh, they uh, they are um, more active than working class so it was the uh, the base of my question and uh, when i see the situation in in poland uh in in the in these two sides ideological sides and the material sides the working class are in very bad shape in the ideological class it is a shame to be a worker every every day from 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 morning to evening they 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 present the propaganda that if you are a worker you are a loser and you have to be an entrepreneur to make your own business because if you, if you work for somebody you are you are nothing you are zero you are and uh, and it, it this it's uh, the, it's brainwashing it's already 30 years and the, the 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 workers people are they 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 very often are uh, not often that but sometimes they go in the street for example in october 2020 we have some uh, movement anti government movement in poland it was uh, uh, provoked by the ban of the abortion but it was bigger but than ban of abortion it was big uh, big movement anti government movement uh, it was very powerful uh, uh, but uh, it's uh, only three two or three weeks and after it's totally uh, it was totally totally destroyed uh, so the workers uh, the most people who participate in this movement were, were people who, who worked uh, like as uh, like workers but they didn't want to present themselves like workers they tried to um, find some other uh, identity uh, because uh, uh, telling that you are worker it's it's a shame in poland and i think that in the old um, uh, countries with the neoliberal neoliberal counter revolution it is the same uh, and uh, the other question is the material situation uh, that uh, mm, th this big difference be between uh, the work workers uh, from emigration in France like me and the people with I work and the these guys who organize uh, the yellow west movement is that that these guys who organize yellow west movement in theory they are rich because they they own the house of course this house that they need to pay pay to bank uh, the, the, the 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 credit but they uh, they own a house they have uh, they have car they have some machine they have something and uh, they are not the uh, uh, and if you if you uh, pay a lot of money to to buy a house and this uh, you need to, uh, you are not flexible to the capital because when capital uh, closed something in your small city you are desperate uh, and worker are if they close your factory no problem uh, next next month I, I will go to another another uh, city i will uh, find another job and it is something that this uh, this small bourgeoisie with uh, already in ideological perspective uh, 20 30 years they said that small bourgeoisie it's um, it's uh, it's the better people in the society um, uh, and also they have some uh, material resources and it is why in the last years uh, in poland uh, uh, if we have some some political activity it's very often people who are who is who i don't consider like a, like a proletariat you know just real quick i think it's funny in the us we seem to have the exact opposite issue where the remnants of our middle class want to act like they're working class want to act like they're oppressed and focus very very much on identity issues that will let them play that role. Um, it's it, so it, it's interesting to hear the sort of 
reverse propaganda happening there. Regarding middle class radicalism, this is a, a fascinating topic for me that I've been diving very deeply into lately. One of our uh, greatest proletarian leaders in the U.S., his name was Gus Hall. He wrote a piece in 1970 called The Crisis of Petty Bourgeois Radicalism. And it explains how the radicalism of the middle classes hits a, a wall of unreality because they're not really dealing with a mass politics based in class and explains how it goes from there. I've been trying to update this theory and apply it to modern America. Uh, it's actually going to be a piece for an upcoming book we have. But I think you you will get a lot out of that piece by Gus Hall. Uh, it's on the Marxist Internet Archive if you're ever interested in reading it, Mikhail. Uh, could you repeat the last uh, sentence? You, you asked a question. Oh, yeah. I just said um, if you're interested in reading that piece, I think you would really like it, especially the way – you're describing the middle class radicalism. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I watched the the question which I prepared for you. I see that uh, uh, I prepared ten question, but it's no, no not necessary. We we have very important discussion, and even if we have only one one question, but uh, it, it's it's not problem. But uh, do you have something to add or I ask a second question? Comrade Carlos. Uh, no, yeah, we can roll into the, the second question if you want. Okay, so my second question uh, was... Uh, um, it's... Uh, um, how is the wittering of the state presented in Marx's writings. What exactly is it supposed to look like? What will the transition from capitalism to, to communism look like? And did the USSR follow Marx's path? Yeah, this is a, a very important question. Um, uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that there's, although it might seem like it, there's, there's no like real like blueprint um in, in in marxism he's never like saying okay this is going to happen in this uh, detailed way and it's going to lead to that and and to this and that and um he he gives you tendencies that you can um if if you follow the dialectical development of society and history you can say well this is likely going to happen and it's going to happen like this and the forces that exist now allow us to see that this is most likely going to develop into this but he's not giving a blueprint. That's the you know the, the first thing that I wanted to lay down. Now, how how communism is uh, is discussed? Well, there, there's a a variety of, of ways that communism is discussed in relationship to the ab abolition of the state. Uh, the, the most traditional way uh, that that it's presented is that the bourgeois state is abolished. Um, it's replaced with a proletarian state which we call the dictatorship of the proletariat. It is an intermediary uh, state uh, to get us to the ultimate uh, goal, which is communism, which is a stateless society. And uh, the proletarian state is not abolished, but it just withers away. It grows superfluous with time. So the, the formula has usually been abolish and wither, right? Um, <clears throat> now, uh, I think that the question the, the historical period that we're in we're still in the period of abolish um and 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 thinking about you know constituting proletarian states and one of the things that happens after uh the success of the bolshevik revolution is that lenin begins to attempt to concretize some of the things that he had been uh, writing about in texts like State and Revolution, which are some of the traditional ideas of Marx and Engels um, about what a new uh, socialist uh, proletarian state required. And what he quickly found, you know, first is, of course, a, a, a civil war that's uh, supported by the invasion of, of 14 
uh, countries, which makes very difficult conditions to to try to uh, develop a, a a socialist state in. But one of the things, that the, the most important thing that that he realizes around 1921, 1922, which is something that the Chinese realized or or realize again uh, in 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 the post cultural revolution era before reform and opening up is uh, takes root is that you need to develop an efficient state you need that the first thing you need to do is develop a state that can protect the sovereignty of the people because as soon as your revolution succeeds imperialism is knocking at the door they're probably already there you know especially after the bolshevik revolution there they've been already there uh, while revolutions have succeeded. So the, the first thing you need to concentrate on is how to protect the revolution, how to protect the national sovereignty of your people. So you need to develop the state as much as possible and as efficiently as possible to do that. So instead of like thinking about, okay, how do we you know remove the state? The main concern for revolutionaries has been, how do we develop it? How do we make the state even stronger so that we can protect ourselves from imperialism? And connected to that, is how do we run the economy in a more efficient way, right? How do we develop the forces of production more, right? The, the, the capitalism presents an arm to forces of production. Capitalism stops and prevents the development, both at the level of the economic base of society, but also at the superstructural level. And the idea is that socialist relations of production are supposed to unleash the potential of the human community, the human community to be able to produce more, to do it more efficiently, to do it in, in line with, uh, you know, a, in, in creating, a, as China calls it, a harmony or a, a rational metabolism between nature and society. So it's supposed to be a better society. That's, you know, one of the first things. And the condition of war communism uh, and the conditions that led the to in the people led Lenin to realize that maybe something like NEP has to be tried, the new economic policy. A similar position is reached by the Chinese after uh, the Cultural Revolution, where yes, you know, China in that period of the Cultural Revolution developed, you know, in, in ways that ne were never seen before. For instance, life expectancy went from like 33 to 67. Um, that had never been seen, such a rise had never been seen in the history of, of humanity. Um, so it, it's not that it, you know, it was a failure or anything, there was large successes, but there was areas where there were failures that needed to be addressed and they were addressed through reform and opening up in similar ways as Lenin addressed uh, uh, the problems of war communism with the NEP. So uh, trying to, to roll back here into the question of the state, the main focus ends up becoming how do we develop an efficient state to protect uh, from imperialism to protect the sovereignty of our people? How do we develop uh, the economic forces of society, the cultural forces, so that we can genuinely build a better society that when people engage with it, it's obvious to people that socialism is superior to capitalism. And there's an important distinction that's laid by Lenin, but then really developed nicely by Mao between political and economic capital. Mao says, we need to strip the political capital fully from the bourgeoisie, a full expropriation of political capital. Economic capital, we should treat it accordingly to context, insofar as the bourgeoisie continues to be a progressive force in the sense of it continues to play a role in helping us develop the forces of production, we can leave them there. But keep them away, you know, it's like, uh, it's like making a house child proof, you know, keep, keep the bourgeoisie away from political power, right? So this distinction is very much important and it's grounded in Marx, because Marx is very clear uh, already in the, in the Communist Manifesto that the proletarian uh, class grabs political power and rests, this is almost a direct quote, rests by degree the economic capital of the bourgeoisie. So especially in the context of, of the revolutions which have taken place, which primarily have been in you know what's called backward areas, areas that have been kept underdeveloped by imperialism, this is a very important point to make. Um, the one of the other things that I would say is that we need to start getting in the habit of thinking of communism not just as the classless, stateless, moneyless society that you know we're all aiming for, towards a 
de-alienated society where oppression is abolished, exploitation is abolished, and you know the kingdom of freedom. Um, we need to also start getting the habit of thinking about communism in the way that Marx thinks about it in, in the German ideology and, and uh, Marx and Engels think about it in the German ideology and in ways in which it is thought also in the, ma in the Communist Manifesto, which is that communism is the real movement of history that abolishes the present state of things, right? And so the, what that makes communism is something that's much more emphasizing process and the revolutionary development of everyday life uh, rather than, you know, this ideal, this idea that we're going to measure reality up against. And in my work and in the work of the Institute, we have been developing the concept of the purity fetish as a way to critique the parts of the left that look at, you know, the Soviet Union, that look at China, that look at Cuba, that look at socialist projects, amongst other things, but, uh, you know, to stick to our topic, that look at socialism and say, this doesn't fit my ideal. My ideal is here. This is my pure ideal. And because it doesn't measure up to purity, I'm going to reject reality in favor of the ideal. And I think that is committing a, 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 a very strong uh, fallacy of dialectical thought. It's, it's completely negating dialectical thought, thinking in lines of you know, how bourgeois metaphysical thought has been thinking for the last uh, 2,500 years, back to um, the Iliadics in, in, in Greece and their obsession with purity and, and the connection of purity and homogenous oneness to truth. So uh, the the importance that we have to lay is, especially when you look at uh, the development of socialism in Latin America in places like Venezuela, in places like Nicaragua, in Bolivia, where they're not taking that traditional route that Marxist envisioned, <laughs> we have to look at, is it abolishing the present state of things? How is it positioning itself with relationship to the most reactionary and conservative forces of the day, which are the, the imperialist forces, which might be socially conservative or socially liberal. They come in a different varieties, especially in the US. So is it abolishing the present state of things? Is it developing the forces of production? Is it protecting its revolution through the development of a strong state? And I think that's how we have to start thinking about communism. At first develop the state, and then only after maybe a hundred years from now, can we start thinking about uh, has the proletarian state, has the dictatorship of the proletariat gotten to a point where the state is superfluous and it can wither away? That's, uh, Carlos covered almost everything there. I, I would like to add though, the, the real, the real essence of Marxism is the study of motion, right? The motion of history, the, the, the world outlook that sees everything in interconnected motion and stateless society is a conclusion, right? That the state arose because it was at a particular point in development and therefore must undevelop as well, like everything else in the universe. But there's a difference between the general laws, Marxism discovers the general laws of development and all of the particular ways that those general laws uh, arise within the concrete world, within society. So what I like to say, it's something my dad used to say, is there ain't no recipe to bake a socialism pie, right? Uh, just because the Soviets did X, Y, and Z, oh, they planned like this, does not mean the Chinese will. In fact, it's very likely the Chinese will do it differently. It's also very likely we in the U.S. will do it differently. And you guys in Poland, when you bring socialism back, will do it differently, or in France. Um, it, it, and we, we understand this in what we call the universal in particular, right? That there is a universal sort of form, right? But that it, it takes shape in particular situations. So the proletariat always arises with the development of cap capitalism, but it's different in different places, in different societies, right? The proletariat of the USA does not develop in the way it did in Poland or in France. We had chattel slavery here, right? And this this is just it, the, the conditions inform that. And what they also do is they create realistic avenues of possibility and action. And this is part of maintaining concreteness that, and just materialism, that 
uh, a lot of people sort of believe that we have that recipe to make a socialism pie. And so they look at the USSR and they say, oh, they didn't do what Marx said. But the, the point is that Marx didn't say what they were going to do. They're just misunderstanding it. And um, I'm sure we'll get to this later, but what they do is read Marx as if he was a utopian, as if he did write a recipe book. I like to, with, with newer people, explain it as uh, people want Marx and Engels and Lenin and everybody else to have written us a playbook to follow. Like if, you're, if you like football or anything, you have a playbook where all the players run specific plays, they run a route at a specific time, etc. They didn't do that. What they did was they developed the language that playbooks are written in. And each team has its own playbook for each season. I also wanted to add just real quick, because I think that uh, both of us forgot it. It's a very elementary point. And it usually happens uh, where we love getting into the weeds of things. And, and I think we forget the, the basics, uh, which is that the, the state arises at a moment when society cannot contain itself because of the contradictions that exist between classes. And so the, the state is by its very nature an instrument of class rule, of the class domination of one class by another. What that means is that under the capitalist context, it is this, the capitalist state, it's a dictatorship of capital which oppresses working uh, people. Under a socialist context, a socialist state, it's going to function in the same way but reversed on its head. It is uh, a state which represses the exploiters and oppressors which might still exist within a country, but which more specifically the experience of the 20th century tells us is that the role of the dictatorship or the proletariat, the repressive role, it's specifically going to be related to fighting off imperialism. So insofar as classes continue to exist in an antagonistic fashion at the global level, insofar as imperialism continues to be a force at the global level, uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat is it's going to be the most advanced form that a socialist society can take, which means repressing basically the enemies of, of the people and using the state to do that. And that's, of course, the experience for the vast majority of working people as democracy. There's always a dialectic of democracy and dictatorship. In capitalism, democracy is democracy for the rich, and that's experienced as genuine democracy for them. Under socialism, it's democracy for the many, democracy for working people, but dictatorship and repression for the bourgeoisie and for the imperialist forces. You know, Lenin has a great quote about that. He says that a liberal can talk about democracy in general. A Marxist never forgets to ask for which class. Yes, I would like to say two things. First, it is practical consequences of this theory of the dying of the state, that in 1990s, the most important class struggles which were in Poland, and these class struggles were very, very important, it was the, uh, the fight against privatization. Uh, so what is privatization? The, the, in the socialist Poland, the economy was controlled by the state. And when the liberals came to power, they said that now we need to make all that all uh, what we can, uh, that uh, state will no longer um, be uh, rule the economy. So they, um, it was the theory of the Margaret Thatcher that uh, the, the the best political politic of the state in the economy is the econ is the politic which don't exist that uh, state will not um, uh, intervene in the in, in 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 the economy so we have some paradox that i marxist support the class struggle uh, support the workers who fight and in the same time i see uh, i toy uh, i say uh, i am marxist and marx is the, for the uh, for uh, for making the state die uh, or weak uh, less state is better. Uh, and in this example is something contrary, that, uh, that in, in our society, 
uh, it's a left force who are uh, defending the uh, state schools, state hospitals, state factories, and other other things which state make good. Uh, and it's liberals which are saying we need to uh, destroy all the taxes and privatize all the things and then there will be only the the army and that's all and uh, so so it is the one of the practical reason that that uh, repeating these uh, things about the dying of the state is not practical in the from from the worker uh, worker struggle today and and second thing uh, which i would like to say is the is the lesson of the commune de paris uh, for me the most important lesson which we can take is that that we have war very very aggressive war between france and germany and in the time when we have revolution in paris and the bourgeoisie in france is scared that uh, this revolution will win in in france and the uh, bourgeoisie in germany is scared also that when it will be win in in france it will came to germany and to other european states so uh, they they decided that we stopped our war and we released all the prisoners which were in the uh, German camps, they released the, the officer, French officers, and these officers released by the Germans, uh, a few months, uh, a few weeks later, destroyed Commune de Paris. The same situation we look uh, in the uh, October Revolution. Uh, uh, that uh, The context of the October Revolution is the First World War, uh, but when the revolution uh, is victorious, the bourgeoisie in Europe make peace, make peace against the revolution. And I think that Marx, uh, when uh, when he examined the, the Commune de Paris, he didn't uh, understand how important is possibility that the bourgeoisie from different countries, which have normally they have... Uh, uh, other uh, interest now uh, the the most important interest of the of the bourgeoisie from many countries is uh, destroy all the revolutionary movement and for this we need very powerful revolutionary state uh, and uh, all this uh, all this talking about uh, uh, dying of the state is uh, is contrevolutionary is is the anarchist uh, bullshit and is it make easier for the for the for the bourgeoisie to destroy revolutions <clears throat> that's really really well said mikhail i think um anarchists often act like we're anarchists but with extra steps right like oh don't worry we all want no state you guys just have a different way of going about getting to know state and being anarchist, but that isn't it at all. We view the entire world differently. Um, and the idea that we can just demand there to be a state or, or demand there to be no state seems childish to me. Uh, or like you said, anarchist bullshit, right? Uh, the state must be recognized as a phenomenon created by a certain period in history, right? By the irreconcilability of class antagonism. And until that's gone, there can be no talk of not having a state. It must be respected for what it is and studied in the ways it changes and how we can affect it. Also remember that um, Marx dies in 83. So like the phenomenon of, of modern imperialism um, really doesn't kick off the ideas that, you know, with the Berlin Conference and around the 1890s is when modern imperialism, you know, according to marxist leninist theory uh, develops. So uh, there's, there's certain phenomenon uh, concerning how capitalism acts when it goes abroad that Marx just couldn't have predicted because they weren't taking place in the way they are now at his time. And, you know, of 
a very clear instance besides you know the role of imperialism in fighting against um revolutionary movements in specific countries which is something that lenin also did not necessarily expect you know you have as soon as the 14 countries invade you have certain articles where he's like where did this come from we have blockades they came at us with everything they tried to strangle the revolutionary baby in its crib um but now we know that that's been the case and it will continue to be the case insofar as imperialism continues to exist but another good example is Marx, uh, Marx felt that when capitalism went abroad, it brought development. And so it was able to genuinely function as a progressive force in backward areas, bring capital and, and develop and destroy, you know, certain uh, forms of relationship that were holding the progression of history back in those areas. What we have found with imperialism is that it's the opposite. It's a force that underdevelops. It's a force that sustains poverty in the colonized world and prevents development in the colonized world. So it's been the complete opposite. For instance, Marx felt that the Russian obshina, the commune in Russia, could be revolutionary. And this is some of the things that he changes his mind on in the 60s and 70s and 80s, right before he dies. He's reading a lot of anthrop anthropology, uh, Maxim Kowalewski. He's uh, reading Henry Louis Morgan with Engels. And, and you know, he's, he's reading these anthropologists and he's like, you know, these these traditional communities, they have communistic relations. And the idea is that if they can get a hold of the advanced forces of production in the West, they can build communism or they can build socialism straight. They don't need to go through a capitalist stage. And the assumption there was that when capitalism goes abroad, it is able to develop those areas that it goes into. And imperialism has shown that it's the opposite. On the contrary, the, the, the force that presents the biggest fetter for the development of the third world is imperialism. Yeah. That's another assumption that, you know, you can't blame him. He didn't see it. <laughs> you can't blame him for not seeing it. But that's something that, you know, that's why we need Marxism-Leninism. It's not just Marxism. It's Marxism-Leninism that, uh, that that we adhere to and that we think is, is correct for our age. Yeah, he, he actually was calling... Uh the Mexico incredibly reactionary for uh, not embracing, you know, the American takeover. And it talked about uh, how progressive that would have been. Uh, I mean, the, the progressive nature of the early U S aside, I think that that's a real focal point in the beginning of him seeing where he was wrong. And he's also writing with towards the end of his life, like where Carlos was just talking about, and I forget their, their names, but there were a few Russian revolutionaries writing Marx to ask him about their peasantry and their rural economy and what they could Vera, do. Vera Sazulich. I'm sorry? Vera, Vera Sazulich. Vera Sazulich. Thank you. Yeah, and th this is really where that solidifies is those letters. But she, he, he had also, he had, um, before Vera Sazulich sends him the letter, and I think it's in 81, 1881, um, there was uh, this guy by the name of Mikhailovsky. He was a liberal in, 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 in Russia, and he was criticizing the Marxists, and he was saying, you know, if, if you really believe in Marxism, you should be all for capitalism coming to Russia and developing, because ultimately, your, if your ideas are true, it would then lead to socialism. And he, he wrote a draft response to that, criticizing the hell off of, of, it, of, of that position, and then the Vera Sasulich letter comes a couple years after, and he still, he writes like four drafts, and then uh, he shrinks from like a 30-something page response to like a four-page response where he's like, no, no, the, you know, this historical unfolding that I have painted, he's referring to capital. Now we have much more material, but he's looking at capital, is something that's specific to uh, uh, Western European history, the development of of history is not unilinear, right? There's it's a multi-linear development where different parts of the world have had different stages, and you know historical materialism, which is really the application of dialectical materialism to history, has to be applied in each of those contexts in order to understand the forces that play best and to understand you know which uh, which forces are really the you know the most revolutionary in that context. If there's no proletariat, then you know who do you go to? Well, you have this peasantry. Uh, that is the productive class of that area and, and that you can use. And, you know, we saw that in China. We saw that to, to, to a certain extent in Cuba. We saw it in Vietnam. We saw it in, in, in Russia. So, you know, Marxism is creative. You know, we, we have this idea that uh, uh, 
uh, we have no, the, you know, the, the bourgeoisie loves giving out this idea and some unfortunate souls within the Marxist movement accept it, that Marxism is a dogma, that, you know, what Marx said, it's conclusive and, and it's the conclusions that we align to. And that couldn't be any farther from the case. What Marxism gives us, as Noah very well said, is is it's it's the, a worldview, a method that we continuously apply to the world. And sometimes our conclusions are going to be different from those that were uh, said in, in 1880 and 1881. Uh, but when one calls themselves a Marxist, they're aligning their, their, themselves to this tradition, to this worldview, to this method, uh, not necessarily to specific conclusions that are dependent on, on time and place. Lenin actually says that people who uh, just memorize conclusions would be deplorable communists without a chance of ever being a real communist. But I want to stress that in order to understand um, Marxism itself, we have to have that analysis that everywhere is developing differently, right? That's within dialectical materialism. And so this notion that Marxism is Eurocentric, that's very hip in the bourgeois academy right now, is silly. It misunderstands Marxism altogether. There is no way to apply what happened in one society to another. You have to take the universal and its particular forms. Okay, comrades, and I am I have very big respect for your knowledge of the Marxist theory. Uh, so uh, I prepared more questions, but uh, I hope that uh, there will be possibility to speak one more time on more time because uh, I, 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 it's very, in my opinion, very good uh, conversation. Um, I would like to, um, uh, the, the last question which I would like to ask you is not, a, uh, is not uh, which I wrote uh, um, before, but uh, temporary question, it's uh, about the situation today uh, in, in Ukraine, uh, but it's connected to Marx. It's connected to Marx and I will say you why. Uh, so uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, in Poland, we celebrated, not me, but our government celebrated the 160th anniversary of the January insurrection. It was insurrection which started in 1863. Uh, it was the uh, insurrections made by the nobles, by the aristocracy uh, against, against Russia, against Tsar. And uh, it is important for the history of the communist movement because in one of the meetings of the with the solidarity with this insurrection, they created first international. So it is some um, uh, event very important for the um, history of the revolutionary communist movement. But I have some problems with this question because this situation with this. Uh, the January insurrection is very similar now to the situation in Ukraine. Why? Because in this time, uh, the government, uh, capitalist government of the Western Europe, they supported the uh, Polish independent insurrections, they pushed them. The, 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 for example, Napoleon the third, the, the king is Caesar of the France. He say, I will help you, I'll be help you. You need to fight uh, uh, sooner or later. There will be French army which help you. And a um, very similar situation we have with the government of Great Britain, which also makes some promises to this so you need to fight but the most important you need to kill maximum uh, soldiers of the of the tsar and this situation is very similar to the situation to, at western attitude towards ukrainian today so you will you must fight against russia you must kill uh, so many people uh, so many russians as it is possible uh, we will give you some hope but we will not uh, help you and uh, maybe it's better uh, 
Uh, and uh, the, the the problem with situation which existed today is that some of the leftist forces, especially Trotskyist, they are together in one rank with the imperialist government against Russia. And uh, Marx, he make situ uh, the things very, very similar to these uh, Trotsky idiots today. Uh, 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 together with the uh, uh, Napoleon III and the government of Britain, he supported Polish Poles against, against Russia, and from the class perspective, it's very complicated because uh, because uh, the, the peasants they supported Tsar because Tsar he uh, he he promised to make the uh, reform of the and he made it. He made it. It's 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 very it's uh, the the two. The two land reform which existed in Poland were made by the Russian forces. First, it was after uh, January insurrection. Second, was after Second World War, uh, because never the Polish nobles gave any anything to to the Polish peasant. It's, it's always Russian. First time Russian Tsar, second time uh, Red Army. So, do you think? That this position of Marx uh, was Russophobic, and uh, if can we support this position, especially in the context today? And also, can you say something? What is your position to the war in Ukraine? I'll be really brief and let and let Carlos take this one mostly. Um, so first, that was really incredibly insightful, Mikhail. I, I actually, I, I really enjoyed what you said. Um, Marx relates Polish independence in this early area to Irish independence. And I think there's, there's something to be said there for them not sharing a form because of colonialism. Um, but at the same time, the parallel with the proxy that that Ukraine is for the empire right now could not be more clear. I don't know if what I would do back then, but I know that as things have advanced and imperialism has taken the form it, it, it takes now, that one must be anti-imperialist in order to hold a position against capitalism within their country. We learn things from the second international, social chauvinism, etc. And for all of the, the sort of fake Marxists running around talking about inter-imperialist rivalries and other nonsense, really, what it is, it, and, and I'll go to a quote from Engels here, uh, what these gentlemen lack is dialectics, right? When you're unable to see the world according to dialectical materialism, which is the best understanding of it, you're very, very easily manipulated. And these revolutionaries somehow keep finding themselves aligning with the ruling class that they say they're against. And at what my question is, at what point do they realize, wait a minute, I like everything the ruling class says. Am I a communist at all? Right. Um, yeah, the way that Marx is seeing that issue in Poland is as a national bourgeois liberation struggle, um, akin, akin, I, I would say more so to the 1848 revolutions, um, which were national bourgeois in character, but which included a proletarian element in it. And he's also looking at czarist Russia as a reactionary force, as a conservative force and uh, he's working under the idea that a bourgeois state, a, a bourgeois uh, liberal democratic republic is a more progressive uh, moment in world history for all its flaws than, the, uh, than a czarist, uh, 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 feudal, aristocratic uh, Russia. And I think that there is a lot of similarities in the way that uh, a people, uh, whether it's Poland or, or Ukraine, are used in a proxy manner to fight against uh, Russia and ultimately are the ones being killed. 
Um, but there's, you know, the, the, the Russia that was in that context in, in Poland and the Russia of today, I think, have, have a, a central difference, which is that I, I think Russia today, although it's not communist, uh, of course, it's not socialist, it is playing an objectively progressive role in world history. Um, because of its existence outside of the sphere of imperialism uh, and because of its active role as uh, one of the uh, most important friends of, of both socialist projects and anti-imperialist projects in general, it's one of the most formidable, along with China, of anti-imperialist forces existing outside of the sphere of influence of, of, of U.S. NATO empire. So I, I don't think that that progressive character that Russia plays today uh, is is shared necessarily by by czarist Russia at the time. So that would be you know one of the differences that I I would like to lay. As far as our view of of the war, I think it's uh, from from what I can tell. I think it's pretty similar to yours, which is that um, Russia is is was basically forced into the situation. You've had a a situation in the Ukraine since since 2014 that there was a coup uh, that uh, was very much spearheaded uh, by uh, U.S. NATO-funded Nazi forces, which have been keeping the Russian ethnic population in Ukraine in a uh, repressive state, uh, banning the language, um, and uh, and you know just shelling the Donbass area, uh, such that you know 14,000 people have been killed since 2014 before uh, Russia even stepped foot in, in Ukraine. And I, I see the escalation uh, that took place in, in February as a defensive, as defensive in character. You know, the most progressive forces in the area, whether it's the Communist Party of Ukraine, which, you know, fascist Ukraine has banned, um, or whether it's the Communist Party of Donetsk or Lugansk, or the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, these forces have been asking Russia to step in to protect the ethnically uh, Russian population in eastern Ukraine since 2014 because those populations have been asking Russia to step in. And Russia has hoped for peace and it has sought out a minst agreements for peace. And uh, now we know, thanks to the statements of Angela Merkel and others, that you know the minst agreements were just done in order to buy time so that NATO and the U.S. can militarize Ukraine so that it's not the case that, you know, uh, Russia would have actually been fighting against Ukraine and not a Ukraine that's been basically injected on NATO steroid in order to 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 endure the way that it has endured and, and continues to endure. So I definitely see that Russia is playing a progressive role. And if we're really in favor of peace, if we're really in favor of of stopping the bloodshed, we have to realize that the sole people that are to blame here are the U.S. and NATO and their puppets in Ukraine, which are the most disgusting Nazi and fascist forces, and the, the biggest come of the earth that you have at this moment in world history. You have a part of the left that loves screaming about how there's fascists in the U.S. because working class people voted for Trump and are carrying the slogan of make America great again. But then these same folks, find it perfectly fine that the elected officials that they can consider to be progressives and socialists are funding and giving uh, the okay side to, to sending more than $100 billion to fascists and Nazis in Ukraine to, to, to kill uh, Russians. So it's, it's just completely absurd, the position that the Western left has taken. And, uh, you know, it's rooted in the Second International and the inability to look at things in a global context, to look at the forces of imperialism and neocolonialism, because the parts of the Third World and the Global South that don't have puppet U.S. governments in place, those governments are on Russia's side, because they realize the historically progressive role that, that Russia is playing at this moment, even though it's not socialist, even though if, you know, if we were in Russia, we wouldn't be with United Russia, we'd probably be with the CPRF, um, we still have to recognize that in terms of geopolitics, Russia is playing a tremendously progressive role in undermining U.S. imperialism, which is a decrepit force right now. So that's, uh, in essence, our, our position. We want the bloodshed to stop, but the, uh, the sole responsible party in its proliferation and its, its existence really has been the U.S. and NATO, which, you know, since the fall of the Soviet Union have been expanding 
eastward towards Russia and crossed a very clear set red line that even U.S. foreign policy officials have said, you know, what the hell are we doing? Here? We're just escalating towards towards a nuclear Armageddon uh, for no reason. So it's, uh, I mean, there is a reason, of course, you know, that the U.S. is threatened by the, in a way, win-win relations, to use a, a concept that's used in China, the win-win relations that uh, Russia has been able to engage uh, in with, uh, with Europe. And uh, insofar as Europe can become independent from the U.S. and de-link its economy from the U.S., that presents an existential threat to U.S. imperialism. So, you know, we see that with the attack of, of the Nord Stream pipeline, which was just revealed by Seymour Hersh to be done by the U.S. in collaboration with Norway. This is something that we have known since the attack took place. Um, any person who has been looking at the situation in any form of a critical, objective, dialectical form would have been able to tell you that. But uh, now the mainstream media is ignoring it, of course. But, you know, the, the position that we have is that we want peace and peace is obtained through rejecting the NATO narrative uh, and, and through asking the people who have been fully responsible for the conflict to stop them. Yes, I would like to say something about this Nord Stream accident that uh, it was made in the day when they open uh, a Baltic pipe. It is the stream, uh, gas stream from Norway to Poland. And I said to my wife, it is not written and it is not public. But I said to my wife that uh, who will who will profit? Uh, the, the, and I said Norway and USA. I am very. Uh, it's not good that I didn't uh, make a video about this uh, to make a proof. Proof, but uh, uh, I was the first who, who knew that it's Norway and and USA. Um, you would have you would have probably been banned because we we made videos. And our TikTok accounts with over 400,000 followers, when we were getting videos on average, getting two, three, four, five, six million views, mm -hmm. when we said the truth, we got banned. And the people who lied and who continued to lie were propped up by the algorithms. They're still online, even after they they have waged a, a, a nonstop campaign against the people of our institute. We've had two of the institute members fired because of these Ukrainian neo-fascist, uh, neo-Nazi mobs have emailed employers to get them fired. We've had like six accounts banned. And it's absurd because the falsity and lies are propped up and then the truth is suppressed and, and, and banned. And the West wants to talk about dictatorship and freedom of speech. It's complete hypocrisy. In last weeks in Poland, we have a big wave of the repression to some people who collaborated with me. Collaborated, maybe it is not a good word because I only um, was agree with their position uh, towards the war and I invite them uh, to discuss, uh, discuss with me in Polish. Uh, and in last it, it started in the, the next week, uh, the last week of the December, that some guys, one, one uh, very old guy, uh, he was uh, the the secret service came to his house and take his laptop and and phone uh, because in the first day. Uh, of the war he supported the nazification and he say uh, he say something uh, about putin and now he will be judged and there are a lot of guy, uh, other examples like this um, um, in the finish I, I i i would like to ask you uh, i am very very agreed that uh, for the things which you said that uh, that uh, in USA, also there are the people who who thinks like like me, uh, but uh, um, the question is, uh, I know a little the situation in the left in the USA, and uh, um, I think that your position is the minority. Uh, could you say 
how many people, how many organization, things like you that uh, in this, uh, and and how many organization um, uh, they support Zelensky and uh, they promote this, uh, um, how to say, primitive anti-Putinist propaganda. <clears throat> well. In the, in, in the situation of being in, inside the imperialist country, I think it's important to understand that they don't have to necessarily be pro-Zelensky. They just have to be either pro-Zelensky or ambivalent. Therefore, it is then permission for the bourgeoisie to do what it's doing. Uh, a, a very strong stance against the neo-Nazi coup government in Ukraine is necessary to oppose our ruling class and oppose uh, what's happening there and leading us into a, a possible nuclear war, which is terrifying. Um, you're right that we're in the minority right now, but things, I, I'm not sure about how it is there, but things here are rapidly changing. Within the last two years alone, Marxism itself and real Marxism has resurged in the U.S. like never before in history. Um, not even at the very beginning when Marxism was new did it grow this quickly. And I'm talking about real Marxism overcoming the distortions. Um, Carlos mentioned there were almost half a million subscribers to the Midwestern Marx Institute's TikTok. And we keep getting more and more, and they keep banning them. So I, the, this, and there's a bunch of other symbols or signs that show us that we are on the sort of nascent aspect of this contradiction of a proletarian movement starting back up and Marxism coming back and the old sort of decaying nature of what we call the fake left or the compatible left as uh the CIA whistleblower. Um, oh God, I'm terrible with names. I think it's Thomas something, but uh, I, yeah, I'm I'm picturing his face on the interview, but it doesn't matter. But right. th this is what he called it. This is what the CIA agents involved called what they created the compatible left, and so that is what we had up until this period, and we're now beginning to overcome that. So I'm optimistic, even though we're still. In the minority, uh, Stalin, in his uh, pamphlet dialect, or in the section of his book, Dialectical and Historical Materialism, said that it is precisely because a thing is progressive and nascent that it is why Marxism focuses on it, because its development spells the undevelopment of the moribund force. Yeah, and I I think that. Uh... This, the state of the left with relationship to this proxy war against Russia, it's very, it's very sad, but it's not unexpected. Mm. That's the thing. It's uh, we, we could have expected it because on the real difficult issues, they always miss because it's this purity fetish compatible left that always ends up functioning as left wing legitimizers of empire. And that goes all the way back to Kautsky and, and the sellouts of the Second International. Um, but... I do think it's growing. And, you know, one of the more surprising things that I've seen is that 35% of the American population in general is ag against, you know, continual funding for, for this war against Russia. Now, if you look at, and this is very strange, uh, if you look at the Trump voters, so the, the, the more conservative part of uh, the U.S., which includes you know, a part of the big bourgeoisie, but it's parts of the petty bourgeoisie and a relatively decent part of the working class. If you look at those folks, it's in the mid uh, uh, 50s. So like 55 percent of them are against continuing to spend uh, uh, U.S. taxpayer money, more than 100 billion on uh, proliferating this proxy war against Russia. But the left has this purity fetish. Uh, that uh, because that part of the working class doesn't agree with all of their social values because they have, you know, it's true, certain 
uh, bigoted uh, views, they don't want to touch them. And they forget completely what the purpose of a revolutionary vanguard is, which is not to say, oh, that's the backward part of the working class. Let me stay over here. No, it's to fucking go over there and remove their backwardness, to develop them and bring them out of backwardness, which you can only do it if you get them involved in the class struggle for socialism. If not, the fascists are going to be right there to take them because that's where fascism is. In the same, the same crisis that produces fertile conditions for, for socialism produces fertile conditions for fascism. So if we don't go there to these people that are right about the fact that this is a U.S. NATO-led proxy war against Russia, and we don't show them something that's very easy to do, how this is connected to imperialism and how imperialism is not a set of policies, it's not a specific government decision, imperialism is a stage of capitalism, there's nothing easier than showing the, the fact that war is connected to capitalism. And the leading anti-war, pro-peace people in the history of the U.S., people like Martin Luther King, W.E.B. Du Bois, all of these people have all been socialists for a reason. And they understood that capitalism and the militarism that it creates when it advances to the stage of imperialism cannot be separated the one from the other. But where is the left? Where is the left? Instead of participating in these massive mobilizations against war that are taking place right now in, in February 19th, they're saying that the mobilizations are too white. That there's too many white people and that they didn't invite the black groups. That's what they're saying. And now they're making yeah. mobilizations in March. And instead of calling, as on you know, it's the right that's doing it, but instead of and parts of the left, you know, there's people like the, the Green Party and stuff that are in there. Instead of calling calling for the abolition of NATO, instead of blaming this whole thing on the people who are to blame, which is the US and NATO. They continue to try to play both sides by condemning the Russian invasion, but then also could try to contextualize it in the, you know, in the situation. If you contextualize the situation, you can't condemn the Russian invasion because it stepped in to save people that had been 14,000 of them massacred over the last seven to eight years and have been begging them to step in. So it's a, it's a very complex situation, but I think that uh, American communists and people with our position are more and more going to find more friends within the American people and, and the American working class than we are within the left. You know, Mao, I, I keep just like adding a quote from a famous revolutionary to something much better that Carlos has said. But Mao uh, said something really brilliant about this. He said, as to the backward workers, communists should befriend them and bring them forward. And if you're not doing that, you're not doing the job of a communist. You're not agitating. And so all of these, the people that Carlos referenced, just complaining that a movement is too white or whatever, which doesn't really make sense to me because 70% of our country is white. So of course that's going to be the majority of any movement. Um, that doesn't mean it excludes anyone and it shouldn't exclude anyone. Um, but rather than doing this, going into the backward strata, you find that these people are primed and ready to hear everything we have to say and are so surprised that you don't condemn them that they're they're the first to jump on board. I, I do it all the time. Well, I, I will read a comment made by the comrade Yuri, which I spoke here a few weeks ago. Great conversation. Sorry, I have to uh, go, but looking forward to watching the entire conversation. My only question is, it is too long overdue for the Western left and certainly the Eastern European left to move beyond anti-communist leftism, the self-Macartism, self-red scare, red biting and overcompensating that I am a good democratic socialist or Marxist Leninist, unlike Stalin, Mao, the Kims, and whatnot. Uh, uh, if you don't know Kamrat Yuri, I, uh, you can contact him and, and talk with because also he he have um, um, the similar position like us. And I would like to comment uh, one thing which you said uh, about the growing Marxism in USA. Uh, I don't know if the, in Poland Marxism is growing or not. Uh, some my 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 youtube channel in polish language growing very very slowly i have some 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 viewers 
uh, but uh, um, I would like to say that uh, uh, when the war in Ukraine was started, uh, I, uh, I I I have problems. Uh, I, I I broke my ties with my party. I was a member. I was founder a Polish Workers Party. Uh, we have um, uh, different problems, uh, but uh, we were not agree towards our position to the war in Ukraine. Uh, they make position that uh, to imperialism and uh, Russia also is bad, like NATO, and and it was and and now um, the uh, in the last last months most of the. Uh, my collaboration, anti-war collaboration, which I made in my Polish channel and in the uh, for the Polish audience, it's not with Marxists. It's very there are some Marxists, my brother or the, a guy like this or comrade Bruno and Monica from Paris, but most of the people which I collaborate now is uh, the radical nationalists. Uh, the guys which were few years few years ago they were anti-semite but it is not very scary because we don't have jews in in poland so they are anti-semite without without jews all the jews population were killed in the second world war and after some of them emigrated uh, which uh, so um, in the time of the epidemic they they became the uh, big uh, anti conspiracy uh, anti conspiracy uh, movement anti covid anti mask anti vaccine uh, all, all stuff like this uh, but th they were active they organized some demonstration against lockdown and now they became the the most important force against supporting ukraine so you see uh, this dialectic the guys which uh, 5 years ago is the radical anti communism and anti semite after he became anti covidist and now he became my comrade uh, against nato because they they are agree with me that poles have to quit nato Pol the, uh, the the us soldiers which are now in poland i consider like the occupation force they need to be kicked out uh, to, uh, now and they they are agree with me and also we are for stopped uh, sending weapons sending polish soldiers and standing sending arms uh, money to, to to ukraine that uh, uh, we are and also we we are agreed that all the ukrainian refugees which are now in poland with the nazi tattoo or uh, other nazi symbolic have to be expulsed from poland today that uh, poland is no country for the banderist propaganda uh, if you are refugees from ukraine and you are against zelensky and against the banderites no problem you can stay you can work with us and, but if you uh, try if you want to be in poland and promote nazi propaganda you need to be kicked out uh, now and i uh, it's only the the only force real force which organized some demonstration in poland this is this nationalist and marxist some of them support nato and uh, they, these who are not support nato they are lazy and scary then they are cowards they they they, they, they think that uh, the, the Polish secret forces, 20 hours a day, they they watched what do, do they doing? And I don't know, I can't say this because the atmosphere and these nationalists, they, are, they, they don't care. They organize one demonstration, second demonstration. They make posters, they make another things and of course all the media hate them because now they 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 repeat all this primitive propaganda that this is the agent of russia agent of putin and stuff like this 
but uh, I prefer collaborate with these guys which have a little courage than with the Marxists uh, which are it's very very complicated to explain mm. Marxists. You, you you seem to give them more leeway than I do. I say if they are siding with imperialism, then they do not deserve the respect of calling them Marxists. Um, they're no Marxists to me. And secondly, just real quick, I'm a Jew. And if someone wants to oppress me, that's their problem, right? I couldn't care less. If they have the power to oppress me, then it's my problem. Then I care. As long as it's some random thought in their heads that has no possibility of materializing in reality, I couldn't care less. And uh, yeah, it's I, I, I think that, um, you know, we, we talked earlier about the dialectic of the universal in particular, and this manifests itself not only in the forms that socialism takes, but also in the forms that class struggles uh, take. So in the U.S., for instance, the struggle against racism has been a class struggle. It hasn't been just like anti-racist fighting. It's been a form of class struggle because when, when the working class is fragmented such that one part of it with a lighter pigmentation than the other wants to lynch the other and makes you know these lynching events into like collective picnics where where people like buy the the nails of the lynched uh, black people which you know it's a disgusting spectacle but when that's the case fighting against racism is it's the same it's class struggle right because part of the essence of overcoming racism and and these primitive ideas that are foisted on working people by the ruling class is showing them how the real enemy is the you know in the case of the u.s there was no black capitalists at the time but the the white capitalists and that their friend is you know the, the black worker and the immigrant worker and all these other different workers um so i i do think that in the case of like uh, your friend who um who you mentioned is anti-semitic like in the process of struggling for you know an emancipatory movement that's how these views change right they don't just change by, by people getting reprimanded they change by coming into contact with the people that those people considered an other uh by coming into contact with those sorts of people and realizing the commonality of interest realizing you know at, at their core we're all brothers and sisters fighting for socialism and fighting for the the conquest of political power by our class that's how things change and we have an attitude in the U.S. that's because of the anti-dialectical character of the thinking that most Marxists have, which is that things are the way they are and they will never change. And, you know, if there's something that we can count on happening is change. If there's the only thing that's actually constant is the fact that there's nothing that's constant, that change is always taking place. And these people that have these backwards views, whether it's anti-Semitism in Poland or whether it's racism in the U.S., you know, you fight against racism simultaneously by showing them that the real enemy is not the other, but it's the capitalist. And in time, there, you know, many of them are going to overcome their bigoted views. Some of them won't, and if they won't, then you know they continue to be, um, you know, lost souls of a working class that they don't stand with. Uh, but you know, the class struggle and the struggle against racism are, are conjoint, um, and you you can't. By separating them from from each other, you end up with these sort of liberal politics of uh, representation as emancipation, and and the sort of thing that we get in the West that we've been calling it wokeism. Um, but yeah, yes, uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, of course, if we had uh, Jew population in in Poland and these guys were responsible for attacking them or killing them the um, the collaboration from my side it will be uh, no possible uh, but uh, because it's it's a uh, it's a shame to collaborate with guy responsible for killing somebody because he is from other nation 
uh, but it's it's not a case it's 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 um, it's it's a long discussion but it is some cultural background of the polish villages the the, the, the anti-semitism existed existed there always or um, maybe not always but 200 years uh, that uh, there was always that uh, the, some jew communities which are rich and some some problems and uh, uh, um, the, the question is uh, why they change the uh, why they why now they are against uh, NATO because in the time of the epidemic they knew that uh, the state is repressive and they knew that the corporate media lie. And we, it, 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 the first week, the first week, uh, week, week uh, of the war, when in Poland we have millions of Ukrainian Ukrainians who came to Poland, and before that, all the time they said you can you can't go to shop without mask, you can't go to shop without the, uh, the showing your QR code and all these uh, all these things. And and after there is war, which started, media stopped to talk about the epidemic. Nobody care if these Ukrainians are uh, vaccinated or not. Nobody cares if they have a QR code or not. The this epidemic, uh, uh, which uh, uh, in in one week. Uh, disappeared disappeared and for everybody it was the, something that uh, media are lying and because media supported one side automatically they are against media so they supported uh, other side not because they love this other side but because they are against this side they are against this repressive state uh, and this media and also one very important thing uh, when we have division in polish society and i choose and collaborate with these guys which some of them are anti-semitic and it is anti-Semitic that in every phrase they try to say, okay, because Polish government, in Polish government, they are some Jewish people, or the bank, uh, they are some Jews, and, and you know, no. and it is something um, the, 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 you need to talk with psychiatry to, to understand what they have, the, the, but it's not scary for me. And in the other side, you have the you have the progressive progressive guys, all these anti-fascists, anti-racists who supported the battalion Azov responsible for real killing Russian-speaking people in Donbas, and they don't care. Uh, so, so I I, I prefer uh, if I have choose between uh, some races and other races, I prefer to choose these races which are not responsible for killing anybody. That's really well said. Really well said. Um, go ahead, Carlos. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we see that here very clearly, all the, all the progressive for, and what, what's funny is that uh, the imagery that's used to describe Putin, um, they got like pictures of Putin with like the Hitler mustache. It's just absurd, you know, the, the people fighting against the people with swastikas and tattoos of like Nazi insignia, those are the Nazis. But then the people with the Nazi tattoos are like the anti-fascists. Like, what type of upside down world are these people, you know, looking at? And what's funny is that, you know, for a very long time, and it's still the case, you just, you, it was hard to find the picture of like Ukrainian soldiers where where a s s Nazi insignia wasn't visible, <laughs> right? Like in Reuters pictures of a guy, you know, a, a medic, and you see the the swastika in his arm. It's like what the hell, you know? I mean, at least be good enough to find one guy that doesn't have a fucking Nazi tattoo. They all have it, and it's uh, you know, it's sickening that uh, you have a situation like you have in the world right now where. 52 countries voted against a resolution that wanted to combat the glorification of Nazism. And a country like the U.S., which has been consistently voting against that. So 
condemning, saying no to a resolution that wants to prevent people from glorifying Nazis. So they're perfectly fine with Nazi glorification. We just passed a bill, a, a bill, no, we just passed a resolution condemning the horrors of socialism. So we can condemn the horrors of socialism, but it's okay if we glorify Nazism. What does that tell you about the U.S. state? And the worst part about that, Carlos and I actually read this in our social media live stream. The, the reasons they are condemning the horrors of socialism are the wildest lies you've ever heard. The whole, you know, 100 million people killed by communism and Stalin ate everyone's babies and their babies' babies and their babies' babies. It's, it's absurd. And so these things are taken seriously by the ruling class class. And at the same time, just I just need to stress this again. At the same time, refusing to vote for a thing that would prevent glorification of Nazis over and over and over again. I, it, where where these so-called leftists that are okay with this come from i i have no idea okay guys um, we need to finish but i need to say um, one important thing maybe i will continue in our another discussion that uh, I, I i i think that you know the very very complicated polish ukrainian history and that Banderites are responsible for the killing most of the uh, 100,000 of Polish population in, in Wołynia in 1943. Uh, and uh, uh, this strategy, which Comrade uh, Carlos said, that they try to find some uh, soldiers without Nazi tattoos, it, it is no longer a case, because now in Poland, uh, they understand that it is um, impossible to find any uh, Ukrainian soldiers without Nazi tattoo. So now they try to make, uh, they relativize this uh, uh, Banderist ideology. They try to say, it is not like this. He was not a Nazi. It was uh, it was a movement for the liberation, national liberation. It is something like Piłsudski in Poland. So so because they they know that that uh, it is impossible no longer say that there are no problem of Banderites in in, in Ukraine. So they try to make, present Bandera like a guy. Mm, okay, radical, but it he, he was uh, anti-communist. He, he hates Russians, so so maybe we can ac accept him. Uh, and and also um, in July, July we will have uh, the 80, 80 anniversary of this uh, killing of Poles. It, it is in um, uh, 11 July, nineteen forty-three. So there will be uh, and uh, and. Uh, and now this anniversary of Vowin, it is something which uh, before nobody cared. But now it is the central things in the Polish society. If you want to celebrate these things, if you talk about this, you are the Russian spy. So the Polish government now say, don't talk about Vowin, don't talk about Vowin, because it can make worse our, our relations with Ukraine. It, yeah, I'm surprised. You know, they say the, the way and they rehabilitate the Banderites. The OUN, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, that was his group, was so extreme and brutal that when the German Nazi Party got to Ukraine, they reprimanded them. They were like, <laughs> whoa, guys, cool out. And this is the Nazi Party that was there to exterminate and enslave the Slavic people, right? Like it's it's wild that they would try to just act like, oh, Vander is kind of, eh, he may have been a little extreme, but he was cool. And the, didn't Zelensky call him a cool dude, by the way? <laughs> yeah, it's... I, I, I'm surprised that they haven't gotten the swastika and just tried to say, like, no, these... It's not the Nazi swastika. It's the Hindu one. 
they're actually all Buddhists, you know. That's yeah. why, that's why they have a that guy with that little mustache in between that he, they have tattooed. You know, that's another guy. Um, Charlie Chaplin, yeah. That's Charlie Chaplin. They're just fans of Charlie Chaplin, and they're all Buddhist and and Hindus, and that's why they have the swastikas. Mm -hmm. but, and then they also like really like that one particular little skull. You know, it's just yeah. aesthetic. You know, they so they're big fans of. of they're fans yeah. of Pirates of the Caribbean, so you know they they put the skull there because they like Jack Sparrow, and they're Hindu. <laughs> no, but it's 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 telling of the state of bourgeois liberal democracies and of imperialism that it's repression is getting to this level. And I just I just spoke yesterday with one of my um, communist friends in Peru, and they're calling the protesters that are waging, which is, you know, indigenous people largely and workers and peasants waging a general strike against the coup government, they're calling those people terrorists. And so if you go on social media and you defend those people waging the general strike, they're calling that terrorist apologia, apologetics, terrorist apologetics, and you can get from eight to 15 years in prison for terrorist apologetics. So it's, you know, if that doesn't symbolize the fact that the global state of capitalism that we're in is more abound, I don't know, I don't know what does. And I, I don't, I don't think it to be impossible that the U.S. escalates towards something like this within the coming years, just because of the repression that we've seen. I mean, they have algorithmic control that wouldn't let like anti-hegemonic views grow as much as they could. I mean, we've seen it in the flesh. We've gotten banned. Uh, we've gotten shadow banned. Uh, and we, we probably saw a lot of shadow banned. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very dark period and, and capital is really showing its claws around the world. And uh, the turn towards fascism, um, or, you know, you, maybe you could call what, what's already here as fascism, fascism that doesn't present itself as fascism, because when a state is 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 when, when when a government like the Biden government is backed by the largest sectors of finance capital, and steps in to prevent a rail strike in order to benefit the big industrialists, but not just the industrialists of rail, the shareholders, which are all finance capitalists. What's that if not fascism, my friend? That's fascism. So uh, the same people that do that at home send $100 billion to Nazis in Ukraine. So it's a very scary state that, that we're in. At it. And if the left doesn't get his shit together and take advantage of these objectively revolutionary conditions, um, it's, it's going to be the barbarism that uh, Berg talked about. You know, TikTok is a perfect way to examine it. We have a control parallel when it was owned by a Chinese company and the, and Midwestern Marks was allowed to grow, having almost half a million subscribers at that point, millions of views on every single uh, video, just growing exponentially. And then they're forced to sell to an American company and American intelligence begins changing the algorithms suddenly we're struggling to get you know even fifty thousand, and we keep getting banned over and over and over again we have videos that don't even do a thousand views for some reason which is unheard of um so this is what censorship looks like in the 2020s and i think because it is so insidious people don't recognize it so we need to figure out a good way to put that in the public consciousness. And this is another thing that is only coming from the right at the moment, right? The right is all about fighting censorship. And these fake Marxists, these counter-revolutionaries are just condemning them and therefore siding with the capitalist class, finance capital, and its censorship. And there's a class issue here because they're mostly the remnants of the middle class. And what is one of the big dogmas about fascism that it comes from the middle class and the petty bourgeoisie? The reason for this is this cosmopolitan social consciousness 
this sort of <clears throat> lends itself to superiority. And that's the whole thing. But I, I think it's very telling that they look at themselves as progressive while every single thing they do is exactly what a fascist force does. Okay, thank you, comrades. We need to finish uh, because we have difference of time uh, in uh, here in Europe is already evening, and I am I start work uh, in four uh, four hour a a.m. in the in night, so I, I need to have some sleep. So thank you one more time. I hope that we will continue this discussion. Well, I am very very happy. Uh, so we have contact uh, and the two viewers uh, I invite to watch your channel, uh, YouTube channel, Midwestern Marks, uh, TikTok. Uh, it uh, exists or they deleted? No. We, we just we started a new one. Right. Yeah. We had uh, we've we've had a band like five times. We uh, were able to grow it again to 150k or so, 150,000. And they just banned us like last week. So we started a new one again. But um, yeah, folks can follow us on our on our website, midwesternmarks.com. Um, and uh, if, if if they can, you know, check out our books and our journal. Um, we, we have ebooks of almost everything, specifically our, our our Journal of American Socialist Studies, which, you know, just came out. Um, so if, if they don't mind uh, and they want to help fund the Institute, you know, they could do it through buying uh, our books or donating or, or whatever the case may be, it's going to definitely help us in the long run and fighting the struggle in the U.S., especially as members of our institute because of the political positions that we take continue to get harassed at their place of employment. So, I just want to say, Mikhail, thank you so much for having us on. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, comrade. I always, I, I, I also thank you. So I finished this. 